you let us know. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ismael. I would like to thank you for joining this important uh, webinar on group-based inequalities, a topic very dear to DESA in general and the Division for Inclusion Social Development in particular. So uh, to reflect on this topic, uh, we are very happy to welcome uh, Rachel Gieselkist. Uh, she is a senior research fellow and member of the senior management team at UN WIDA. And she is a political scientist and international development professional with two decades of experience in academia, applied research, international research group management. Uh, she contributes to uh, an inequality topic in several academic journals. So we are very happy to have uh, uh, Rachel with us. So to make good use of time, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, so good afternoon from Helsinki and good morning to New York. Um, so today I'll be talking about addressing ethnic inequality and I'll, I'll start by giving uh, a sort of brief overview of the project that I lead on, on ethnic inequality at UNU Wider. And then I'll discuss some of the emerging findings. Um, and as I was mentioning to Marta, I think um, a lot of the work, as you'll see, is in draft form and, and in working paper form. And so this is a nice moment to get your comments. And so I'm really looking forward to your advice and, and discussion and suggestions in the, the sort of latter half of, of the hour. Um, let's see. OK, um, so addressing inequality between groups is, of course, a core component of, of leave no one behind. And our starting point in the work is that inequality matters. It matters, of course, in and of itself, and it matters because of its consequences for other things that we care about, for uh, peace, for governance, for economic performance. Um, and we're focusing here in the project on ethnic inequality, by which we mean inequalities of opportunity and outcome linked not to anything an individual does, but to their situation at birth and their ascriptive, the ascriptive social categories into which they may be classified. So this is a broad, uh, broad use of the term ethnic, um, referring to ascriptive or referring to social categories that may be linked with race, language, indigeneity, national origin, religion, caste, culture. It was too fast there. And in the project, we focus on the, the core question, can or how can ethnic inequalities be addressed and greater equality supported? Uh, what policies can, can serve this purpose? What factors influence policy adoption and implementation? And what might then be done to support the adoption and implementation of better policies? So our project, um, has several core components. It's in fact um, phase two of a two-part effort and the phase one project was part of the previous work program at UNU Wider and it focused much more on measurement and sort of mapping of trends within and across a set of countries um, and then uh, as well on the political implications of, of ethnic and group-based inequalities. So in the current project, we move from focus on ethnic inequality as sort of a causal variable um, to more focus on ethnic inequality as an outcome. And the project comprises five core components or work streams, but I'll focus principally here on the first two. So the first is a set of work on policies and experiences of addressing ethnic inequality. Um, it includes an edited book project based on a set of case studies that I'll discuss a bit more later, um, a brief uh, monograph, um, and we also had an open call for research on the topic that, that brought in um, a, a handful of papers that we workshopped together a few years ago. They're working papers on the website and a couple of articles out or, or soon to be out there. The second core component is a set of work on affirmative action around the world. 
So affirmative action, of course, is a core policy that's often considered to address ethnic inequality. And we, we try to build sort of the knowledge base here on how these policies have been employed and on their impact across countries. So we have an effort to build a cross-country database on affirmative action. Uh, we've done a systematic review of the literature on the impact of affirmative action policies. And then we have a handful of, of desk studies um, uh, in that area. A third component to mention is we have a set of work on inequalities between migrants and host country populations. Um, this was largely completed a couple of years ago. It's um, out as a, the, the core work is out as a special issue of the Journal of Ethnic and Migration Studies, and I'm, I'm happy to discuss a bit more if that's of interest. Um, we also have a set of work looking in a, I guess, a more theoretical way at, at horizontal inequality as an outcome and, and including the relationship between horizontal inequality and social mobility. So that's a couple of articles there. Um, and then recently with one of the research uh, fellows, research associates here, we've been doing some pilot work on, on, on building the cross-national data on income inequality by various groupings, drawing on the lease data and the, the PovCalNet data, and trying to link that with the World Income Inequality Database that we have at, at UNU Wider. So in my, my comments, I'm going to highlight four points, four sort of emerging arguments and findings. Um, and to briefly summarize them so that the thread of the, the presentation is clear, um, the first point is that in order to realize the goal or the yeah, the goal of, of leave no one behind, we need better understanding of how and why particular policies are adopted and implemented, of the politics of these policy choices. Second, um, we have, I think, good toolkits on the policies to address vertical inequality, but we need to build um, better toolkits on policies to address uh, horizontal and, and ethnic inequality in particular. Um, and I'll suggest that one way to usefully map such policies, which I'll call inclusion policies, is in terms of targeting and, and scale. Third, inclusion policies imply redistribution across ethnic groups, so they're inherently political. Um, and this politics is influenced critically by the structure and relative power of groups, which have influence on the adoption and the implementation of policies, as well as um, by extension on their impact. And a key implication of this um, is that um, we should be spending more time on context and perhaps less time on, on impact evaluations in thinking about how we proceed to, to address um, inequality. And then fourth, among uh, group targeted policies, affirmative action is of course a key approach across countries um, with many different variations. Global evidence suggests positive impact in multiple cases, but also some points for caution in the adoption of such policies. So moving to the first point, um, there's of course a well-developed literature on policies to address inequality. Um, and a number of mappings of such policies. I know you've done mappings at UNDESA. Uh, just uh, for simplicity, the table here is, is one example. This is from a 2021 book by Olivier Blanchard and Danny Roderick. I think it's based on a conference discussion, an edited book. Um, and this is from their introduction. They present this taxonomy of policies mapped along two dimensions. Uh, one is the stage of the economy in which at which the policy intervenes, whether that's pre-production, production, or post-production. And the second is the kind of inequality targeted at the bottom, uh, middle, or top of the income or wealth spectrum. And as they point out, there are quite substantial literatures, uh, certainly in economics, on policies in each of these boxes. And so, um, in other words, and indeed in their words, we have the tools to reverse the trend, reverse the rise in inequality. So the obvious question is, if we have the tools, why isn't inequality fixed, if you will, right? And this is, is sort of a puzzle if we think about policymaking the way that we talk about it in, in UN and development circles and the way that economists often talk about it. So in particular, we, we tend to talk about policymaking um, with 
suggesting that we have implicitly in mind um, either some sort of benevolent social planner um, where the, the government adopts policies that maximize social welfare and the policies that are adopted are the ones where the, the evidence base is strongest, or that we have in mind some sort of rational voting, rational economic voting model where when inequality is high, voters will support redistribution and that will be the, the and redistributive policies will be adopted. But obviously, we all know that this isn't how policies are made in the real world. Um, and in order to better understand then um, how, uh, how um, inclusion policies are adopted, which policies are adopted, um, we need uh, to better, we need better models that, that take politics into account. So we can think about, for instance, political economy models that take into account non-economic issues and identities, um, more political science and political sociology approaches, that highlight the role, um, for instance, of politicians and parties in shaping interests and identities. Um, and we can take into account models of the policymaking process, such as Kingdon's multiple streams approach, which gives insight into how policy problem and politics streams come together to influence um, which policies are adopted and, and how they are adopted and implemented. So in brief, a big question for research on inequality is not necessarily, I think, at this point, about the precise impact of different policies and programs, but about why and how particular policies are adopted, adopted and implemented in the first place. So this comes to the second core point. Um, I think that fair to say we have a, a good toolkit, a quite established toolkit on addressing vertical inequality. Um, but a less clearly established toolkit on how to address ethnic or horizontal inequality. So if we go back to the typology that I showed earlier, um, it's clear that when we think about a situation where ethnic inequality is high, addressing vertical inequality to some extent will address ethnic inequality or group-based inequality. And we can also think, um, I think as suggested in red here, about targeting some of these sorts of policies to groups rather than individuals. So there's some applicability of the, the framework. Um, but on the other hand, this sort of basic framework misses a lot when we, we think about the broader literature and discussion about ethnic inequality and ethnic exclusion. It doesn't, for instance, say much at all about um, anti-discrimination legislation and sort of obvious policies that would pop into mind in discussions in this area. So um, uh, just summarizing, uh, skipping over a lot of literature, because there's a lot of work here, um, I would propose that a fruitful way to map policies and perhaps to discuss the, the toolkit of inclusion policies, um, as suggested here, is along two dimensions. So on the one hand, is the policy targeted and how? Is it directly targeted to disadvantaged groups or marginalized groups? Is it indirectly targeted to another overlapping category or group? Um, or is it more universally framed? And then secondly, on the other hand, what is the extent of institutional change implied by the policy? Are we thinking about major systemic change, such as revision of the constitution or reframing of the, the nature of the state to be multi-ethnic and defined in a different way? Are we thinking about something in the middle? Or are we thinking about a policy, uh, a situation with little or no uh, institutional change beyond the adoption of a particular program? And I think one of the areas for further work and that we need to work on more uh, in our project is to think about the different um, policies in, in this map and sort of tease how well that this framing would capture would help us to think about the different options and consider them. This then uh, brings me to the third point. Um, in building and, uh, oh, sorry, my third point, I should summarize the third point. Um, inclusion policies imply always some level of redistribution across relevant ethnic groups. 
and the structure and relative power of these groups will have influence on the adoption and implementation of inclusion policies, as well as on their impact. So in building and sort of probing this argument, we build knowledge on policies and experiences of addressing ethnic inequality through a collaborative theory generating project, an edited book project, um, based on comparative consideration of eight in-depth country case studies. These are selected for diversity in terms of the structure of groups, um, as well as the type of inclusion policy. And as you'll note, if you're familiar with these cases, some of these um, involve explicit targeting on an ethnic basis. Some don't. Some are more universally framed. Think of uh, Bolsa Familia in Brazil. Um, and some clearly are, are not successful. Some are, some are considered um, generally considered successful. So each of the cases is authored by a scholar with deep expertise on the country and topic. Um, and we've discussed them collectively and, and sort of thought about different framing of, of collective learning across the cases. Each of the cases makes a different argument, but they respond to a core set of questions. And in particular, they try to address the question in red. So what are the key factors in understanding the politics of policymaking and implementation to address ethnic inequality? Then um, bringing the cases together, we have a very, very simple framework for discussing them comparatively um, and trying to understand the politics of inclusion policy adoption and implementation as suggested in the, the schematic here. So it starts with the social structure of groups and inequality along with some sort of shock whether it's an external shock or perhaps something that's internally generated through maybe activist uh, mobilization. Then there's um, broad, this is followed by broad identification in the country of ethnic inequality as a political problem for the country, for a, a national political problem. And then by political mobilization and social conflict, uh, which may be expressed through routine forms of politics or through, in some cases, um, non-routine routine forms, violent mobilization. Then eventually, um, there is some resolution in the form of an inclusion policy choice and the policy is then implemented um, and sustained or not. Pushing a bit deeper, we can think then about how the type of inclusion policy adopted might be influenced by the relative power of groups. Um, and in short, um, thinking about the relative power of groups in, a, in at least in an electoral democracy in terms of the size, the voting power of the different groups. So here, for instance, we see um, a simple representation of how, um, how the policy is targeted or not. Uh, might be influenced by uh, the size of the marginalized group um, with the expectation that uh, when the group is either very large, so a clear majority, or very small, it uh, might be more likely to have, we might be more likely to see a, a targeted, ethnically targeted inclusion policy. Either because the majority is able to push through le legislation that benefits their group explicitly, or because the group is so small that having explicitly ethnically targeted legislation isn't a political threat. Um, so we see in the green shading that there's suggestive evidence of, of, um, of something like this happening, although there's very obviously a lot of nuance uh, in the cases. We can also think about um, the expectations in terms of um, the type of inclusion policy adopted in terms of the scale of the policy and the level of or the degree of institutional change implied and how this might also be influenced by the structure of groups. So here, for instance, um, we think about how major state sy systemic change might be most likely when the marginalized group is very large and politically powerful. Um, and least likely when it's not. So you see the green shading along the diagonal. And again, there's some suggestion in the cases that this, this is broadly um, seems to be happening, but again, there's a lot of nuance across the cases when you, when you look at the, the specifics. 
But the broad point here, the key implication here is that structural and political context matters a lot in policy adoption, implementation and impact. Um, and we should then, I think, be especially cautious in implying uh, findings from impact evaluations of policies in one context elsewhere without attention to these structural and political contextual factors. Um, and that, I guess, furthermore, even more than, than more work on impact evaluation, a priority for research in this area is why a policy was adopted in the first place. So then this brings me to the fourth point, um, the first broad or fourth broad point uh, that among inclusion policies that target groups, affirmative action is, of course, a key approach across countries. There's a lot of uh, different variations across countries. Um, and as I'll show, global evidence points to um, affirmative action policies having positive impact in multiple cases on ethnic inequality, but also some key points for caution. So in this stream of work, we've sought to build knowledge on affirmative action across countries and the, the sort of universe of cases. And there are two core elements here. One is the systematic review work, and we have a new working paper, two new working papers that came out in January. Um, the, the major one by Simona Schotta, myself, and Tarsicio Leone, and then a, um, a second set of work to build a policy database. And we have, I'm, I think it'll be up on the website um, next week if it's not up already, describing um, findings from version one of this database. And this is a paper by myself, Simona, and uh, Min Kim. So um, let's look first at the systematic review, which was developed following sort of standard systematic review guidance and approaches. We started by screening the literature to identify over 4,000 publications, eventually identifying 195 studies for inclusion. Of these, 181 were case studies covering 27 countries spread across five world regions, while 13 were comparative works. And as suggested in the map, the coverage is heavily geographically concentrated. So with more than 70% of the case studies focusing on four countries, the US and India um, and Brazil and Malaysia. And we, the second working paper that I mentioned earlier is actually focused on the findings from the US and India and trying to drill into to those findings in particular. So in brief, you know, much of what we know about affirmative action and its impact from the quantitative literature is based on these four cases. We consider affirmative action policies in the review uh, targeted at ethnic groups. Um, when they're targeted, for instance, at women, we include information on that, but we don't include them because they're targeted at women. So it's only policies uh, with, um, that are ethnically uh, targeted. Um, and we look at policies in three core domains, in education, in employment and business, and in terms of electoral representation. And as suggested here, the policies target various types of groups falling under a broad ethnic label. So some target in terms of, of race or color, some by caste, indigeneity, region, uh, religion, and then there's a whole bunch of other uh, studies. And then, um, the studies, as suggested here, consider a diversity of outcomes, including various measures of educational attainment, employment, earning, earnings, performance, and political participation. And so for this reason, because the, the outcomes that are studied are so diverse, we don't do a meta-analysis of the work to sort of identify specific uh, impact, but we are able to look at direction of effects, whether it's, whether those effects are positive, negative, mixed, or, or insignificant. Um, just to pull out a couple of snapshots from the, the work, um, the figure here summarizes uh, the primary effects on core target groups of, of policies across the studies in each of the domains. So green here indicates Positive impact, red, negative, and yellow mixed, and uh, the dark blue is, is insignificant effects. And as you can see across the domains, there's support 
in the work for positive impact on target groups with um, the strongest evidence in terms of the, the work on policies in the, the domain of education. Uh, a subset of the studies also look at impact on other groups, and this suggests less positive effects on, on non-target groups. So on the left, we see um, what we can glean from the studies in terms of impact on non-target marginalized groups. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot more red here than there was in the previous uh, chart. And then on the right, on non-target, non-marginalized groups. So for instance, with if you think about affirmative action policies in the US, this might be the impact on, on white Americans or Americans of European descent. And again, um, a much uh, less uh, positive picture here, much more negative effects in terms of these groups. So we build on these findings in then a sister project, the sister project to develop a database on affirmative action policies around the world. Um, and we start this by, by um, we started this thinking there would be perhaps another database on affirmative action policies around the world. There is one on educational policies, but we didn't find other work doing what we, what we tried to do. Um, and so we think it's important to sort of fill this, this gap or speak to this gap in the cross-country evidence base. Um, the slide here gives a sense of, of some of the, the structure and the numbers and in terms of variables that are covered. The database provides detailed information in a standardized format on the design and modalities of affirmative action policies, as well as on their adoption, implementation, associated controversies, and impact. So for each of the countries in the database, and in version one, there are 53 countries, we've done a fact sheet, which is usually three to five pages, and then there's coding in a you know, large Excel spreadsheet with, with multiple um, pages within it. Um, and in version two, which is the sort of focus of this year, we want to um, consult a bit more with experts to check and, and build our confidence in the codings, make sure we're, we are not missing things, especially in countries where there is either a really large literature or really small literature to draw on. Um, and we also want to expand, we're also working to expand the coverage. In terms of the the coverage, we fo focus on affirmative action policies that are either anchored in the Constitution or in national or federal law, and that target a nationally recognized ethnopolitical group. Um, we focus on policies that were active in the year 2000 or that were implemented between 2000 and 2021. So the map here gives a sense of the country coverage for the version one data set. Um, and you can ignore the colors here because this is just uh, illustrating uh, the stages in which the coding was, was developed. Again, we look here at affirmative action in different policy domains. So in, in um, a few more domains here. So in education, in public employment, private employment, political representation, and a, a catch-all sort of other category which tends to be in particular land and housing sometimes. There's a bunch of different things that, that caught, get caught there. So as an example here, there are, these are the countries in the database with policies in the education domain, and there's a total, I think, of 17 cases. Um, and this is the political representation domain. I think this is 27 cases. Looking at origins, uh, for instance, in a majority of cases, we find that about 64% of the cases, um, that in about 64% of the cases, the adoption of affirmative action policies was linked to a new constitution. And in about a third, about 29%, with major violent conflict, including civil war, riots, or, or violent protest in which at least 25 people died. About 20% are linked with nonviolent protests or, or civic action. In terms of policy termination, um, for instance, there are not many cases that, that uh, we're able to include here, um, but a handful of cases in, in most of the domains. Um, and 
possibly suggestive differences in terms of, of how uh, the different policies terminate. So some, some end because they were set up at the start with a fixed term, some because there's an official decision that the policy has reached targets uh, or that it hasn't reached targets, that it's not a successful policy at all. Some have ended because of violent conflict or a change in government. I think some of the most interesting um, uh, coding in the data set is, is on uh, public, major public controversies about the policies. And it's also some of the coding that's the hardest to do. Um, but uh, we can see, um, as summarized here, uh, that in the majority of cases, policies are linked in some way to major uh, public controversies and debate. And this is true across the domains and perhaps especially uh, clear with the policies in terms of in the education domain. On the other hand, um, our data at least suggests that such controversies are associated um, more with national protests and civic action than with violent events. Um, and most controversies in our sample are associated with critiques about the impact of the policy on target groups. This is about 80% of, or this is 80% of the, the cases. Some are also uh, controversies around impact or targeting of other groups. Um, and controversies tend to be linked more often to the amendment of existing policies than they are to the termination. They, it's only about 2% of the cases where the, the controversy leads to termination of the policy. Um, finally, we can briefly consider institutional evaluations of policies across the domains. And while we don't here conduct a systematic review of the evaluations in each of the countries, we, we try to get a sense of the major official government evaluations, the sort of major scientific evaluations and the major uh, evaluations in, in public discussion. Um, so the this shouldn't be read as, um, we don't reanalyze the data. This shouldn't be read as clear evaluations of the policy, but this is a sense of how they're seen and discussed in, in the countries. And I think one thing that that's uh, worthy of reflection here is that at least in the this cross-country database, the evaluations overall seem to be quite critical, much more critical than in the, the systematic review um, results that I, that I showed earlier. So with the majority of of evaluation suggesting either failure or some sort of mixed impact. Um, so broadly, this is version one of the database, and I think it illustrates that affirmative action policies are clearly in wide use across countries, often with ado adoption linked to major shocks and reforms. They tend to be quite controversial and publicly deba debated, um, although linked only in a minority of cases to violence. Um, and that there is some difference in terms of evaluations of impact in in this um, uh, in this uh, from this view that when we compare to the systematic review of of um, of the literature. So, um, in summary, um, it's clear I think that meeting the challenge of leave no one behind is uh, is political or involves a lot of political challenges, even more than, than technical ones. And I think we've spent a lot of time in development discussion and research to date focusing on the technical challenges. And so priority is, is more attention to the political challenges. The political challenges can be especially intense when who's left behind overlaps with ethnic divisions. Um, a good place to start here is in terms of building the toolkit of inclusion policies, perhaps usefully mapped in terms of scale and targeting. Uh, there is a large literature on ethnically targeted policies like affirmative action, and there's some evidence in the literature of positive impact, but the generalizability of these findings isn't clear. Um, and they're, they're based clearly on a on a small number of, of cases, which have peculiarities like any small number of cases. 
It's also clear, both from our work and, and others' work, that affirmative action policies pose risks in terms of backlash and intergroup conflict, uh, within group inequality, incentivizing ethnic identification, and the freezing of distributional conflict along ethnic lines. On the other hand, um, they might also be the best hope in some contexts for um, correcting persistent intergenerational inequalities and legacies of systematic ethnic exclusion in a timely manner. Uh, and we argue this in, in a, a recent uh, chapter. So uh, in brief, a priority I think for research is to, to build knowledge in this area, both on the toolkit um, and the politics of, of adoption, implementation and impact. And I'll start there with a plug to please look at the project webpage. There's a bunch of um, publications there and there's more to come, uh, hopefully an edited book, um, a short book and a bunch of articles uh, and a version two database. So let me stop there and, and um, welcome your thoughts and comments and, and in particular your suggestions on, on what to do next. Thank you very much, Rachel. Very interesting and useful information. Definitely we'll have a look at the website. Yeah. I'm really interested with this project regarding the data set. So uh, time for question. Yes. Ma yes, Rachel. Yes, thanks so much for the presentation. I find that every time I had the opportunity to hear you six months ago, but every time I learn new things and there is a lot of information that comes in and that you answer the questions, I find myself having a question and then you say, no, but we looked at that and then you answer the question. <laughs> so, but I still, just for the sake of answer, asking, I have two. One is more technical than political yeah. and it's of course, it's very hard to find counterfactuals, right? But I wonder if we, you found a way to look at whether devoting the same amount of capital, financial and political, to an affirmative action measure or else devoting it to investing in a universal measure, whether there are different, what, what's, what's best, right? Say, like, instead of, yeah, like, on education, increasing teachers' wages or like uh, increasing their qualifications or measures that may be geographically targeted but not ethnically targeted, whether it's, you know, what what has been more effective, if there's any way that you can look at that. And the other is like you've partly answered about the, the backlash and the sustainability of these measures. I was wondering whether, uh, I mean, it can even be not only that they, the measures are terminated because there's a backlash, but that that backlash has political consequences as well, as mm -hmm. we have seen uh, in this country, for instance, right? That uh, they may give rise to populist movements because they are visible measures, right? Yeah. And so yeah. If, if there's any of that, but yeah, that's it. So. Yeah. Should I respond or? Yeah. Oh no, so, you can take some if you want. Yes. What what do you prefer, Rachel? I uh either way. Can okay. can I ask can I ask a, a kind of a related question to what Marta had? Yes, William. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Rachel. Um I um I I I learned so much and I, I think this is a very, very impressive uh, research project and and also, I think it's a, it's a very, very useful. Um, I think this is an area where there's just so much general kind of, you know, discussion in the public domain, but the kind of uh, evidence, right? The the kind of um, uh, database you are building is so, I think is, is direly needed. So this is just in itself, I think it's a, it's a huge, uh, huge service to, um, to uh, researchers and policymakers, I, I really commend uh, uh, you and Wider for for doing this, and for you uh, to uh, you know to you for for leading this work. And uh, related to Marta's question, I I was also thinking of um, targeted policy versus universally framed uh, programs, right? So um, I just wonder in your uh, in your research, maybe maybe you have done so. I I just kind of missed. 
Um, is there um, kind of a comparison uh, uh, of those two groups of policies in terms of impact? And you know, I saw that you had the uh, you know uh, 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 the the percentage of areas of policy that encountered controversies and possible pushbacks. But you know, did you do uh, a a similar comparison by say the kind of policy? Right, it's a universal or or universally framed or more targeted. Maybe the sample is so small. I don't know. Is it just? As a, a thought, and so I think that would be uh, would be very interesting to to see, and especially for practical policy purpose, right? Um, uh, so um, that would be my uh, supplemental uh, question. And and once again, thank you so much for doing the work and for sharing with us. Thanks. Thanks. Should I respond to the first set? Yes. yes. Okay. So thank you both for your for your really generous um, comments, and I think these are great comments. And I'm taking a lot of notes because <laughs> I think especially so the the question about counterfactuals and doing sort of a direct comparison of impact for ethnically targeted versus more universal policies, um, we don't do that. So I <laughs> maybe we should do that more directly. Um, I don't know exactly how to do it, and maybe you have ideas on the, the best way to go forward. Maybe we can do at least some discussion in in the book, in the edited book based on the case studies to think about what the what the options or uh, what the potential might be. Um, I think, I mean, it's difficult to say because counterfactual arguments are always challenging, uh, but yeah. But I, yeah, that's something that I think I need to tease out a bit more. That's definitely important. In, in the, the chapter that I mentioned uh, by uh, Patricia Funjinka and myself, which is part of a, a book we have, um, Kunal Sen, our director, edited a book on, on social mobility, and we did a chapter on social mobility and, and horizontal inequality. Um, and we did some sort of ex thought experiments thinking about if you could equalize um, intergenerational mobility uh, across different ethnic groups um, would that how long would it take for you to get greater equality greater horizontal inequality and I guess the argument there um, is that it would take a number of generations even if you were able to do that so so the idea is even if you get a universally framed policy that equalizes chances across groups it still might take a while for for things to trickle down um, and that's not even counting things like wealth inequality across groups. So I guess, I mean, we could make an argument that way that that at some it, for some countries, at least not having not having targeted policies will then mean it will take a very long time to get to at least in our argument to get um, to get uh, greater or sort of reasonable ethnic inequality across across groups. But I think. Um, I take the point that it's probably useful to look at that more directly and to make a more direct argument there. And maybe the place to do it is with the, the edited book collection and think about what can be teased out there. Um, the other question about backlash is, yeah, I think that's also a really important point and, and well taken and it comes out um, certainly in the cases and we see it in the US uh, for instance with <laughs> with um, uh, discussion around ethnically targeted policies being so politically polarizing um, and uh, you know at some level it begins to then threaten the continued implementation of the the policy and at least in the way that it was originally conceived uh, so that's certainly uh, important to to spotlight as well Yes, hi Rachel. Jonathan hi. here. Thanks again for the really interesting um, talk. I you answered a lot of my questions, but I have a lot more as well. If you don't, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't mind humouring me. Um, the first question, just related on that, is so you don't at all code, um, you know, political backlash in your in in the model at all. So you don't. There's I know it's very very hard to assess, but 
would would there be a way to look at you know a five year time horizon after the implementation of a policy and and assess whether or not there was some political backlash to it? I don't know whether that's possible. Um, and then um, the question about um, you know the the stressing of the importance of political context and political factors in you know political economy factors. Um, so what uh, what's your kind of broad experience in when even admitting that politics is a factor is a challenge you know is is inherently a political act in itself to say that you know in this economic model that we have we're uh, we are going to admit non economic factors so you know what are the experiences from your kind of cross country um country expertise of when those moments of admitting for those non-economic factors have been done. Um, another way, another question I had was on the kind of emphasis that you put on context and how important context is. Um, like, for example, in assessing the, the impacts of interventions to address ethnic inequalities. I wonder, do you have any I or so that's which phrase this. Um, is there a, a risk that the emphasis on context can um, kind of reinforce the status quo where you can say, well, we don't know the context well enough, so we can't do anything at all, you know, so it's a way for maybe elite groups to say, you know, you need to know context better before, mm -hmm. for example, international organizations, donor organizations are going to intervene and use resources in a specific way to address ethnic inequalities. Does that emphasis on context risk? Kind of reinforcing the status quo. Mm -hmm. um, and my last, my very last question. Sorry to bombard you. Um, no, this is thank you. <laughs> uh, on the on the um, controversy issue. So the you mentioned the largest the largest outcome was the controversy for the interventions impacts on targeted groups. Mm -hmm. With respect to affirmative action, was that that those that the controversy was because the, the interventions were doing too much or too little in addressing the needs of the, addressing ethnic inequalities for the target groups? I just wasn't clear on that um, specific point on one of the graphs. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I I think I got them, but you should tell me if I'm not speaking sure. to, yeah, to the point. Course. But on the first point about political backlash, so in the affirmative action database, I think we get at that through the controversy coding, um, yeah. at least we try to. So, um, I mean, we look at a whole bunch of variables around controversies. I'm just looking at the list. Uh, so whether in each of the policy areas there's controversy, whether it's controversy that's linked to violent conflict, whether it's controversy that's linked to protests that are not majorly violent, but just sort of regular uh, protests, national protests, um, whether the the claims are, whether they're claims by uh, whichever group, by the target group, by non-marginalized groups, by uh, the majority group, um, whether there are, um, whether the controversy is linked to um, other factors and we take some notes on that that we can kind of pull out. So I think that we get a little bit, we, we try to get at the backlash through the controversy coding, um, yeah. but the controversy coding was really challenging. So, <laughs> <laughs> but we certainly get at it a bit through that. Um, yeah. the, the second question, so about how do we, about, you know, um, recognizing politics in, in this area and how do you get um, admission that politics is playing a role? I mean, I think, yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> it's certainly a challenging thing. I think one place where it's clear is if we, in our previous project, um, under the previous work program, uh, we had a, a set of work using existing data to try to think about measurement and trends in, in ethnic inequality in a, in a set of countries. And when you look at the available data, one thing that becomes really clear is that there are a lot of groups that we know are politically and socially salient that we don't have information on. Or, and there are a lot of countries where we know that there are ethnic divisions where we don't have good 
data, right? So Tanzania, for instance, or in India, for instance, publicly available, um, uh, up-to-date information on on caste has been a, a challenge. Um, and I think when you when you think about the reasons for the, the, the reasons that that information isn't collected, or if it's collected not made public, um, it's hard not to talk about politics. And so mm -hmm. I think yeah. that's maybe a, a nice entry point in coming from the technical side to say, well, we know that these these things are salient, but we don't have information on it. Um, uh, the third question about context, I think that's, yeah, that's a good point. I guess I, I was trying to make the point about context more in terms of, of understanding what policies are adopted. But of course, as you say, you could you could take that point and say, well, you know, uh, in our context, we this is that we're we're sort of society is structured this way, so it's not appropriate to think about policies to address ethnic exclusion. I mean, in the extreme. Um, but I I guess I would try to spin the context discussion that way, um, and think about it more in terms of understanding what the the sort of realm of, of feasible and likely policies is and what the sort of uh, challenges might be around particular types of policies. Yeah. So if we're thinking about applying lessons from, I don't know, uh, policies in Vietnam where to a really small minority to, to Bolivia or to South Africa, I mean, <laughs> that there's obvious problems there when you talk mm -hmm. about context, about the sort of social macrostructural context. Um, and then let's see, the fourth question about controversies. Oh yeah, the controversies in terms of target groups. So I think these were controversies for the most part um, about whether the policies actually did what they wanted to do and did them as well as they should. Um, right. If it was if it was controversies around whether other groups should have been targeted or whether whether the sort of targeting should be expanded to other non marginal to other marginalized groups or to or whether there was a problem with um, whether it was unfair to target these groups and not benefit also the majority population that would have been captured that we try to capture that under other coding. Okay, great, thank you. Yes. yes. Hi, Rachel. Um, let me just add my voice and thanking you so much uh, for your time this morning and for for um, talking to us right now about your ongoing work. I had a couple of questions um, and, you know, specifically how it relates to our work on inequality and how we think about inequality. And one of the questions um, that I feel like we always ask, but we haven't gotten very into is the relationship between economic inequality and group based inequality. And so, you know, to what extent um, economic inequality can be explained by group-based inequality, but then also how um, these two facets interact. And so specifically in thinking about policies to address ethnic inequality, then I'm wondering if you've covered thus far um, how in economic inequality might influence policies that are meant to reduce ethnic inequality, such as like elite capture of um, certain policies that are meant to address um, ethnic inequality, but then the benefits go to those who are most the, the, the economically well off amongst the um, groups that are ethnically targeted. Um, and then maybe how stigmatization also plays a role in terms of the ethnic policies. Um, I, th I have a second question too, just in terms of, uh, and I think we're we're focusing a lot on kind of the backlash and the political views, just because I find the slides you showed where you show what the public's perception of the impact of affirmative policies to be so very shocking, right? And not shocking, but very impactful. Um, and it, it leads me to a question then around challenging norms and prejudice, like to what extent would, how do you know, does affirmative action, can it stand alone? Or does it have to be somehow fit in or or accompanied by policies that affect the underlying norms and prejudices around ethnic 
inequality for it to actually have an impact because I don't, you know, people could say, well, I don't think we believe in this policy because it's not working or it's not having the intended impact, but there could be a lot under, you know, sometimes when you ask people why they're unhappy, they don't actually are able to, 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 to explain exactly why. Um, I had a third question now that that is escaping me, um, but I'll just leave it at those two for now. And if it comes back to me, I'll try to ask it. Great. Um, this is so helpful. Thank you so much. Uh, so let me let me start with the the last question. Um, yeah. So let me start with the last question. So um, I think you know what we see. If you think about policies that are sort of broadly considered successful, like for instance, the new economic policy in Malaysia, um, or um, well, or the the adoption of these sort of big scale affirmative action policies. I mean, a, a lot of times they are maybe accompanied or have come in with with some really big shock. <laughs> so there's sort of broad social recognition or broad national recognition that maybe the risks of not reforming are really going to be problematic for national stability. Um, so in, you know, in Malaysia, they're after, this was after race riots and, and so on. Um, and I think, I, I guess that my sense would be that when you have that sort of shock, then that can maybe help to build um, momentum for the reform. And it's pretty hard to, to have some of these major reforms without that kind of uh, that kind of momentum created by a, a big shock that is uh, sort of nationally recognized as a, a moment of that could threaten the national stability. Um, so I suppose, yeah, I suppose I would frame it a bit more that way rather than in terms of changing norms and, and prejudice. Um, yeah, um, then I think um, then you had a second point about stigmatization uh, in terms of ethnically targeted policies. And I think that's a that's a really important point. And it's a, a point that I'm still sort of wrestling with because I know it comes from a lot of, there's a lot of discussion, certainly in the social policy literature, which I'm less familiar with. Um, and um, I think that's something to that's worth um, dealing with a bit more directly. Uh, I guess coming, so I come more from the ethnic politics literature, right? And so from the ethnic politics literature, the the concern about ethnically targeted policies is especially that it, it sort of privileges ethnic or incentivizes ethnic identification, where otherwise you might see that uh, as countries develop and industrialize, people have a many have many different identifications, but they but perhaps some of the ethnic identifications might become less salient in in politics over time. So I guess I would think about it. I guess my concerns around the ethnically targeted policies are especially in that side, but I think the, the stigmatization point is is well noted. And I, I want to look into that more. And if you have suggestions there, that would be really helpful. Um, and then, so the first point around thinking about the relationship between ethnic inequality and, and group-based inequality, um, I think that's also a really important point. And I was kind of hinting at it with the 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 point about within group inequality that um, that uh, you know that is a challenge when you think about group targeted uh, policies that of course there's a lot of diversity within groups um, and you see in a lot of cases I mean there certainly comes out in our South Africa case study that it's certain <laughs> certain parts of within the group that that benefit more than others from from some of these policies um, so that that um, that definitely comes out in the in the case studies as well. We don't in the cross country, you know, so in the affirmative action database, we don't we don't have that degree of nuance. I mean, unless it comes out in the controversy coding or or in the sort of 
yeah, in, unless it comes out in the coding around controversy and the co data collection around controversies, but it does certainly comes out in the case studies. Okay, so <laughs> yes, thank. Uh, I mean, yes, William. Thank you very much, Rachel, and uh, your presentation gave rise to so many questions. <laughs> it means a lot <laughs> to us. Thank you very much for your time. So maybe it's time to. So now, if Rachel, if you don't mind, we at least our team will stay a little bit longer. Uh huh. Um, to, to tell you what we are planning to do and continue asking your questions, probably. <laughs> That's <laughs> wonderful. If, if, yeah. But in terms of the webinar, uh, if uh, when you are welcome to stay or, or to go, this will be more about the, the, the work of the of the team right, for the next report. But you're welcome to stay if you want to. Well, thank you.